Hello, I'm George Liston CA and welcome to Dialogue, a program that explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. For those of us who love the genre of crime fiction, it's always been clear that the best of these novels are far more than simple whodunits. They are literature of a high order. These novels can often serve up marvelous portraits of cities, societies, and cultures, acquainting us with life as it's lived in lands far removed from our own. P.D. James and Ruth Rindell provide indelible portraits of an England where crime reflects the social change of our time. Luis Alfredo Garcia Rosa has created Inspector Espinosa, who serves us well as a lens focused on Rio de Janeiro. And in this city, George Pelicanos has captured the gritty rhythms of a Washington that few politicians recognize and no tourists visit. All of which brings us to Sacred Games, a novel by Vikram Chandra that's set in Bombay and opens a window on that city and India itself. And my guest is Vikram Chandra. Welcome to Dialogue Vikram. Thank you. Let me hold up this book. It's a marvelous cover, mm -hmm. and as everyone can see, it's a very big novel <laughs> yes. in every way. In fact, Vikram, it's a novel so vast that I'm going to tell you that my native city of Buffalo, New York, gets mentioned. Oh, yes, it does. In, yeah, yeah. And uh, I was really struck by that, but the focus is not on Buffalo. It's, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. on, it's on uh, events and characters set in Mumbai, yes. Bombay, and of course, uh, and on India itself. In India, I think in a very interesting sense, the both mil the millennial culture of India and the modern day reality of India. First question is obvious. Uh, does a book with a compass so vast uh, get put together by design or is it the power of your characters that tell you it must go this way? I, I, the characters and, and following them, I think, through the complications of their lives. Mm -hmm. um, when I started, I actually thought I was going to write a very local book about crime on my street corner, uh, which you know you could see very clearly. Mm -hmm. um, but as I started thinking about this um, and, and talking to people who knew about that world, it became obvious, of course, that you couldn't just talk about organized crime as an isolated phenomenon, mm -hmm. that it was obviously linked to local politics in very intimate ways and national politics. And then, therefore, uh, religion and, and um, a kind of uh, fervor about religion mm -hmm. and its uses in politics then right. also became part of right. the, the book. Um, and then, of course, um, the media, the burgeoning television industry and the always powerful mm -hmm. Indian cinema industry, um, which in some ways is very intimately located with, um, connected with the underworld and has played a large part in its narrating it and mythologizing right. it also. Yeah. Um, and all of this then within the context of uh, finally, you know, I'm talking to somebody in Bombay and he says, you know, you should go to Delhi and talk right. to so and so. And then the Delhi person says, well, you know, but you can't really talk about this without going to Punjab and speaking to so and so. This is a book that goes where it has to go. Right, right. It makes these connections because these are the connections that have to be made. Right. And of course, uh, Mumbai, where this is set, is to me as a reader a major character in this book. And I have a, a I was talking to a friend last week, as a matter of fact, from India, uh, who made a point I found very interesting. Let me test it on you. Mm -hmm. That Mumbai itself is a city of a special distinction within the context of in India. Right. As I listen to him, I begin to think perhaps a, a bit like New York in this mm -hmm. country is both of this culture and yet somehow a little distinctive. Right. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I think so. And I think it's played that kind of role right from its founding in that for one thing it sits on the coast and mm -hmm. it's been um, the door in a sense through which many cultures have moved in the right. last couple of centuries. So often ideas, concepts, ideologies get tested out first in Bombay mm -hmm. and then they spread to the rest of the country. Um, it's also a city full of immigrants and um, as Gillian Tyndall called it in her very, very good book, um, uh, the title of her book was The City of Gold. Um, and there's this, still this belief about it that if you come from the countryside or a small town, Bombay will somehow find a place for you. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so it's got this energy and this entrepreneurial spirit that's very mm -hmm. alive and people work tremendously hard um, and have a c tremendous kind of resilience. Um, and so I think it, it um, 
it resonates um, very fiercely with with this idea of making something of yourself Absolutely. or being able to escape perhaps mm -hmm the traps that you're caught in mm -hmm. wherever you are, but then you can remake yourself here. The city of strivers, right, and right. people on the make, literally on the make, yeah. in ways both good and not so good, perhaps. Right. I was struck also uh, by the style of this novel, Vikram, in the sense that uh, we have multiple stories, obviously. They overlap, they come and go, and often what seem like digressions are not digressions. Mm -hmm. So one question I wanted to ask you is the very mode in which this kind of story storyteller mode, is that also an insight into how narratives are developed in India? Right, yeah, I mean, I've, I've always been interested in that um, from this, the, my first novel onwards. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think partly it is because I grew up with these Indian stories being told to me um, um, by my aunts and my grandmothers and my mother, um, where part of the convention is that you can interrupt one story to start another. Mm -hmm. And a character can suddenly say, but wait, that reminds me of, and mm -hmm. then the, you, one level down, and then another level down. Yeah. And it's kind of dizzying at times, but it also is um, terrific as a writer because you can create these juxtapositions and ironies yeah. by placing things next to each other. Well, you actually you, take this in a new dimension because we have one of our main protagonists, uh, Ganesh Kaitan, Speaking to us from the grave. <laughs> yes. Uh, there's a post-mortem right. quality right. to all of his. Yeah, right, of his. right. Yeah. Um, and, and I suppose that uh, for me, he's also trying to come to grips with his life. And the only way he can, he can understand who, is, who he is is by telling his story to someone yeah. else. Yeah. And I think that the, uh, the, the, the primeval importance of narrative in human lives, I think, is something mm -hmm. that I'm very... Uh, I guess fond of that idea, mm -hmm. and I think that we we come alive in telling stories and and to other people and listening to other stories and receiving them. I fully agree with that. Yeah. I want to focus uh, now and and of course throughout our conversation on the, the to me the chief protagonist uh, Sartaj Singh, the detective who uh, first investigation of what looked like uh, mystifying but rather uh, not common but. Well, if crime can be ordinary, ordinary crimes that lead us into different levels, ultimately right. to international intrigue and terrorism. S Sartaj Singh, um, yeah, I'm sure you've heard this a lot of times before, did give me certain echoes of Philip Marlowe, yes, of yes. Sam Spade, right. and uh, uh, Espinosa, the inspector of, uh, of uh, Garcia Rosa's stuff, right, right. Has, has a lot of this world weariness. It's very right. charming. Right. Here's the question I wanted to uh, pose to you about him to get your fix on him. He's a Sikh. I know little of Sikhism, but it seems to me that it does combine elements of Hinduism and Islam. Mm -hmm. Does right. that put him at the middle distance of the right. society we're dealing with? Right. I mean, I, um, I, I, when, when I started thinking about him, in, in the strange way that characters sometimes do, he appeared to me more or less fully formed mm -hmm. as a Sikh. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any ready or plausible explanations for that. You know, some of my friends, when I was growing up, especially a couple of them were, I was very close to were Sikhs. Um, and so after I started writing about him, uh, actually in Love and Longing in Bombay, the book of mm -hmm. short stories, it then became apparent to me that that was a very useful distance to give him mm -hmm. um, from the local culture, from the politics of the department and so forth. And so it became very useful. It also, I think, um, uh, his, his, the past of his family then also in terms of echoing some of the, the issues that uh, of partition and uh, yeah, North well, India, yeah, you know, I, that comes in. Oh, that does. I really want to get to that because there is a um, uh, interior monologue, so to speak, of his mother's right. and her experiences that's just riveting. But there's a, a couple more qualities on Sartaj Singh. Um, through him, there's another reality that I perceive that the underworld of, in represent the world everywhere, but certainly in this book of Mumbai, Bombay, mirrors the overworld yeah, in the yeah. sense of you've got corruption. It runs through society. So here we have a man, Sartaj Singh, who's on the take to some right, degree. Right, right. And he can also be brutal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yet he remains a sympathetic figure to us. Right. So I, you know, I found that very... Right. I, I, I wanted to, um, I suppose, n not make editorial comment on, on him and mm -hmm. try and see the world through his eyes and, and Ganesh's eyes. Mm -hmm. um, um, as faithfully as I could achieve through them. And for somebody like him to survive in the world that he lives in, mm -hmm. immersed as he is in this culture-wide sea of corruption, it, it's very hard to survive without making some kind of compromise with it. And some of it, I think, is 
excusing himself, you know, and making mm -hmm. making reasons so that he he doesn't feel that stab in his stomach when he thinks about his father. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think as a matter of everyday intercourse, it's something that he has to do. Mm -hmm. And I think also uh, policing everywhere in the world is, a, I think, a tremendously ambiguous mm -hmm. business because. Um, Often, you know, to catch bad guy B, you have to have a yeah, relationship exactly. with bad guy A, and yeah. then what? How, how far will you let this guy go? Um, and yeah, you, you know, that's, that's very interesting because the people who also bring that point actually put a fine point in it are his assistants. Right, yeah. that was it Karakter? Ka Katakar, yeah. Katakar, yeah. who gets killed. Well, yeah. I shouldn't pay, we shouldn't kill people, but <laughs> yeah. it's, it's going to happen. Yeah. Let me tell you. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the Campbell, the, the young fellow who's right. kind of a rogue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, but you get to like these fellows as yeah. well. You know, yeah. they're not. Uh, yeah. They do what they have to do, I, yeah. I had the feeling. Yeah. The, um, the balance or symmetry between Ganesh Gaitan, who is a, a kind of a, I guess in our sense, a mafia overlord, a don right. of right. Mumbai, right. who literally from, you know, just claws his way up to the top, right. Right? is capable of enormous brutality. But he, he balances Sartaj right. Singh very interestingly. Talk about that balance. And here's one aspect of it that I was struck by. These two men are going to develop romantic attachments, or close attachments, but yes, that way, yes, yeah. to two sisters. Right, right. And, you know, I was just struck by that right. symmetry, too. Well, I, th I think you, th the word you use, symmetry, is, is very appropriate. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I suppose I was playing partly with, with the, uh, the old um, juxtaposition of the heroic figure and mm -hmm. the villain, you know, which, so every Sherlock has his Moriarty. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, except these two never meet, almost. They don't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, he does, Sartaj Singh lets him through to the guru. The guru right, yeah. so they meet twice in the book, and once Sartaj doesn't know who he really is. Uh -huh. um, and I, I think a, a large part of the book is, is interest in how we use various narratives to make meaning of our lives. So uh, when Ganesh Gaitunde finds a guru, the guru tells him that look around at the world at you, there is mm -hmm. symmetry, there is shape. Mm -hmm. And if there is shape, then there's a design. Mm -hmm. And Gaitunde buys that. So in a sense, um, and I hope I'm not sounding too sort of postmodern with this, but uh, I think the reader also, when you read uh, this book or any book, you also mm -hmm. do that. You look for a certain design. And, yeah. and see if you can find meaning in the shape. Exactly. So there's lots of symmetries scattered, yeah. I think, throughout the book. And, and uh, I'm struck by that. You know, mm -hmm. you look for a design and find meaning through uh, through through its interpretation. But also, uh, Vikram, it seems to me that in this novel and perhaps in in the Indian novel, uh, you all this can be done in a very different way than we might encounter it in the West. Right. That is to say. Uh, who, who would I want to use here? But let me use Ganesh right. as an example. Uh, the characters are, are not afraid to relate themselves to the mythic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, the, the, their relationship with these gods is very personal, and this, right. they draw from that right. sense of themselves. Yeah, so, yeah, ab absolutely. And I mean, I think this is, it's a reality, everyday reality in people's lives. And, and um, so that um, you see yourself then as part of a larger design. Uh -huh. And as you said, the, that you're, intimacy with your God can be very personal. In other words, um, to choose an example that's not exactly um, correct here, but you know, you can love Krishna as a, a child, so as a father or mother feels towards a child, or as a friend, or as a lover. Mm -hmm. So um, what happens, for instance, to Ganesh Gaitonde is that once he's persuaded to see this large design that he becomes a part of, um, that narrative, in a sense, holds him in its thrall. Mm -hmm. and, the book then, I, I, I suppose, meditates might be the word to use on various kinds of narratives, you know, the narrative of nationalism. Yes. And of the secular sort of solutions or stories of mm -hmm. Marxist Leninism right. and so forth. So, um, in a sense, the whole book is about um, making meaning, I think. You know. That's well said. That's because I can instantly understand, having read the book, what you mean by that. And you mentioned nationalism as one of the right. uh, narratives that, and in that sense, I was struck, and I, I, you touched on this earlier, uh, by that portion of the novel where um, Sartage's mother, who's uh, the widow of a policeman as well, is sitting there in this kind of, it's, uh, to me it's almost like a reverie, and right. she's remembering her girlhood, and you, as, she, as she develops it, she realizes this is just before the partition. Right, right. That, but the effect of that, Obviously, very well written. It, it seems to be searing and lasting. I mean, this is still very important in India. Yeah, yeah. No, and um, 
That's exactly right. That that um, the the impact of that still sort of reverberates and and keeps rolling like a wheel, you know, mm. through our everyday lives. So, in some sense, when a bomb goes off a Bombay train today, it has mm -hmm. something to do with what started 60 odd years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the effects of these kinds of um, historical forces and disparate, un seemingly disconnected lives on each other, uh, that, that sort of mesh that all of these things creates mm -hmm. was, I suppose, the, the, the thing that I got really interested in. Mm -hmm. and, and part of the, I mean, the central reason why the book grew in size and thematic scope mm -hmm. was I kept thinking about this, about yeah, how you yeah. can be separated by thousands of miles or by you know, time. Mm -hmm. And Sartaj might not know what his mother is thinking at a certain point, mm -hmm. but his life is still affected by what the mother went through. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, it plays out in all kinds of ways. I'm reminded as you speak that one of the characteristic qualities of the underworld, at least in the two, mm. and it's interesting that when I said earlier that the underworld mirrors the right. overworld, the gangs are called companies, yeah. which is yeah. interesting. Yeah. And, but among the companies, at least initially, there seemed to be very little concern about whether one was a Hindu or Muslim. Right. Mm. In, in reality, that the underworld, especially in Bombay, was always a very secular place because mm -hmm. the god you worship was money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so as long as the, the revenues were rolling in and power was maintained, you, mm -hmm. know, you didn't care who you were working with, mm -hmm. caste or creed. But I think after the events of the early 90s, and then the involvement of the companies in the geopolitical struggles of the great game, um, then these schisms started to appear and being right. exploited. You know. What is that great game, by the way? Is it Leela? Leela is the <laughs> end word for the play, the, the, the play of the gods. Gods, right. Yeah, well, there's several sort of, uh, I suppose, layered meanings. One is that, that the great game, um, as in, the, was the use the word used, for instance, by Kipling to describe right, you the, know, the, the, mm -hmm. the intrigue for power and dominance yeah, in the so subcontinent? Yes, yeah. exactly. And then there's the the yes, the the Leela, the the life as the play of the Lord in that mythic way. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I th uh, what's also interesting to me, uh, particularly because of language, is that the gangsters themselves use sporting metaphors. Yeah, exactly. cricket. <laughs> cricket. A lot of, yeah. lot of cricket. A lot of cricket in there. Uh -huh. So if you're going to bump somebody off, you say, I'm going to knock over his wicket. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, and they use the word game for what they do as well. So. I should point out that, uh, and those metaphors are very beautifully drawn, and they occur very naturally throughout this book, as does your use of um, Hindu mm -hmm. words. Right. You know, uh, There's a glossary at the back of the book for uh, those who care to consult it, but very often you just get it through context. You right. Know, you, know, you know basically what they're talking about. Right. I mean, I, I, my effort was, or my intent while I was writing it, was to use the English that we actually speak, mm -hmm. um, which, um, for example, if I was sitting around a table in a bar in Bombay and telling one of these stories to a friend of mine, I would use an English which was sprinkled with Hindi and mm -hmm. English and, and Marathi and so forth. Um, so it seemed to me that also is a part of the texture yeah. of modern India, this, the changing language. And it goes mm -hmm. both ways so that the English that we're using is, is being shaped by these other languages. Mm -hmm. The Hindi that we speak and now is filtered through with English. I mean, down to the very smallest village, you know. Right. You know, this is actually a marvelous introduction uh, to something I wanted to bring into this conversation, the word filmy. Yes. Filmy is an adjective. It's right. sort of film-like. It's a wonderful, yeah. I think I'll use it now, yeah, <laughs> sort of word. But it really points up another mm -hmm. enormous theme of this book, and that's the importance of Bollywood, yeah, yeah. Of, of the Indian. Well, you've been a part of that, too. Yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, film industry in, uh, in Mumbai. I, right. mean, I, I think it's, it's uh, always been a, a tremendously important part of the culture, and then I think of the nation state. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, filmmaking in India started very early, and, and then the first film that was made, if I'm remembering correctly, had something like 18 songs in it. Mm -hmm. And it drew from the local traditions of street theater and sort of bourgeois theater, but also, I think, classical traditions. So it's a very, it's a form that comes from somewhere, and it speaks to us, I think, in very intimate mm -hmm. ways. Um, and has formed, I think, part of our national conversation yeah. since independence about who are we, what are we becoming, what are we abandoning? Yeah. Mm. But you know, part of this, this is marvelous, because part of the, the, this vast kaleidoscope mm. is Bollywood, its sophistication, its use of uh, ancient cultural forms in a modern context. And all of this coexisting, I've got a page reference, maybe I won't have to, to open it up even to use this, because uh, 
I can tell you exactly. Page 772. <laughs> all right. Uh, I, I noticed this wonderful sentence about all over India we meet farmers, and it goes on to talk about these farmers right. who are willing to commit acts of, right. I guess, murder against yeah. uh, children to disobey them in marriage and such. Right. And this coexisting with the sophistication you see, it strikes yeah. me as... Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, what we think of as modernity and its encounter with tradition is not at all simple. So um, some things that we think should cease to exist when when you become modern, in mm -hmm. fact, get r even more reinforced. Mm -hmm. And I think of something, for instance, like caste, which since the encounter with the British, and especially their legal system, became codified in a certain way and then built into, not built into, but it becomes an impermeable, uh, a very intimate part of the democratic system. Mm, oh, I see. So because people then end up voting sometimes along caste or regional lines. Mm -hmm. So instead of caste disappearing, mm -hmm. it actually then, in a sense, um, reinvents itself. Mm. And so if you are on a, an Indian matrimonial site, website today, you can do searches by caste? By caste, by, by a huge variety of them. That's interesting. Very fine distinctions about who is who. Yeah. And which, at the same time, then, you know, there are lots of people who don't care about it at all, but then it also coexists. And so there's this seeming contradiction and paradox, but yeah. it does, it's there. It reminds me of uh, one of my favorite uh, Latin American authors, Alejo Carpentier. Yeah. He's talking about, well, actually, wars in Latin America, but conflict. He said it often seemed as though it was fought between people living in different centuries, right, right. but in the same place. Right, and right. It's amazing. In the same way, I was struck by um, a, one of the complexities of, of India and many developing societies, the role of women. Mm, there yeah. are a lot of very powerful women in this yes, book. Yeah, There's yeah. Ifa Bibi. Yes, she yeah. doesn't appear, yeah. but she seems like a pretty tough yeah, character. Yeah, she is. She uh -huh. is yeah. Uh -huh. um, I, I think, yes, um, I, I've grown up, I suppose, under uh, or, or with very powerful women, mm -hmm. and, and um, uh, while all of the, the the usual images of Indian women being oppressed by patriarchy and and uh, are certainly true, mm -hmm. there is also, I think, this other truth that coexists with that of a huge authority within a certain limited range sometimes, mm -hmm. and then sometimes, when even when they step out of it, and. Um, Smart politicians, for instance, like Indira Gandhi, are very canny about this, right? Mm -hmm. She becomes prime minister um, way back, um, yeah. 40 years back, by people who think she's going to be a puppet, and then she just, she, she plays that role mm -hmm. um, using very explicitly ideas about goddesses. You know, mm -hmm. India is Indira, Indira is India, and then, you oh, know, she, you oh, know, uh, you know. That co-identification. You're right. Yeah. Oh. So, um, there are these these women and and across all kinds of classes and so yeah. forth who um, struggle with with the system as it is mm -hmm. every day, but then also are, are very strong and, right. and do things and and actually manipulate manipulate mm -hmm. uh, the system uh, yeah. as they as they should. At the center, the core of this book, um, there is the mechanism of a, uh, if you will, of a a conflation of mysticism and crime and terror and right. everything, right. Um, which is a very dark vision. Right. And it seems to me the reader does two things. You know, First of all, you suspend disbelief to read a novel to start one. Right. But then, of course, you have to believe at a certain level this can happen. Right. Right. And I guess that is the question. Is it, it's, I mean, is the subcontinent potentially, could, things, could these things conflate in this way? Right. Well, I, I, that's one of the things that, that I I suppose play with during the book. Uh, there's an intelligence agent in the book who actually reads thrillers mm -hmm. <laughs> and very apocalyptic thrillers, and he thinks that well, of course it can't happen. Mm -hmm. And then um, um, the use of the word filmy, for instance, you know, when when they start fearing something's going to go wrong, um, several people say, well, it's too filmy. You know, if it mm -hmm. happens in a film, it can't happen in real life. And I think. What happens to us in a world saturated with media is that we consume these fictions um, as a kind of palliative, right? Mm, yeah, um, yeah. And, and we feel safe because in the end, the day is saved, usually. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, but I think we also sometimes reject the possible, mm -hmm. you know, reality itself um, when it happens because we think it's too much like a story. 
<laughs> so that that when when some awful disaster happens, almost you know, a lot of the times I've heard people say it's just like a movie. Yeah, I've said it myself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So um, I think that edge of belief and disbelief um, in our time, especially, I think, mm -hmm. is is especially keen. Yeah. And I would like to believe that no, these things would not happen. But I think in my darker moments, mm -hmm. when I think of what human beings seem to be capable of, mm -hmm. uh, what sometimes seems to be a sensational fantasy remains only that way until somebody does it. You know, and then it enters the realm of the real. Unfortunately, yeah. I, unfortunately I have to agree with yeah. you. I wish I could say no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have only a moment left, but I wanted to conclude on this note because so much of the novel does deal with film culture and, and you have your own involvement. I'm moved to use a cliche from the film world, you know, coming soon to a theater <laughs> near yes, you. Yes. Coming soon to a theater, theater near you, in, in one enormous sense, is India itself. Right, right. Because I would think, and I suppose this is the question, and we'll have to limit it almost to just a couple of words from you, but right. the economic power of India, growing as it is, does that portend a, a greater cultural impact on the world? Are we going to have to, you know, we view it now as a, a great uh, millennial culture, very exotic, right. but it's going to be in our homes and lives. Right, I, I think so. And I think um, one example of that is the slow filtration of the Indian cinema into uh, the yeah, West. And yeah. I mean, I, even from five years back or 10 years back, mm -hmm. people who wouldn't know anything are now suddenly realizing, that, well, there's this huge industry on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. um, in a sense, Indian writing in English itself. Um, I, I want to say this, but at the same time say that we're going through a very precarious mm -hmm. um, period also because there is this growing power, but we have millions of people who are without the basics. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and they know what they don't have. Right. I guess the last final words are stay tuned. <laughs> yes. And read the book. Read, thank you very much Thank for you. bringing this book to us, Vikram. Thank you. My, My pleasure. pleasure. And that's our program. We appreciate your comments, and you can reach us at dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. I'm George Liston CA, and you've been watching Dialogue, a co production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHC Networks. Dialogue's also on the MHC Worldview channel, which is available to public TV stations nationwide. For more information, go to www.mhcworldview.org. And please join us again right here next week, and thank you for watching. And thank, thank you, Victor.